Welcome to Photographic Exposure, The Complete Guide. My name is John Gringo, and I have a great class in store for all of you. This is a class I've been wanting to make for quite some time. I wanted to cover just exposure. I know there's a lot of other very important things to taking a great photograph, but exposure is easily one of the most, maybe the most important element to getting a good picture. And in this class, we are going to be covering a wide array of topics in great depth all focused on exposure. So what do we mean by that? Well, what is exposure? Well, it's the light that's coming into your camera lens. But there's a lot going on in that little statement. You see, we're talking about the amount of light that's coming in. We're talking about overexposure, underexposure, proper exposure. But maybe much more importantly is the way light is recorded. Shutter speeds, apertures, and ISOs can have a huge impact on your images. It really helps you tell the story that you want to tell. And in this class, we are going to be diving into every conceivable aspect in what you need to know for getting the right exposure. Now, this class is based off of my I don't know, three decades of information gathering in this regard. And one of the things I've done is a lot of research for this class. And one of the kind of fun side things that I've found is that there are dozens of ways that different people have found to measure light according to the industry they're in or their particular needs. And this is all very interesting and it's good. And if you want to look up what some of these mean, it's, it's kind of fun and interesting, I think, for certain geeks out there. But in this class, we're going to be focusing on photographic exposure and light. And so we're going to be really concentrating on, yes, those three important critical factors, shutter speeds, apertures, and ISOs. And I know right now that a lot of you are already fairly familiar with this stuff. And that's okay, because we're going to dive deeper into this and get you even more knowledgeable than you currently are on these subjects. Now, that is just kind of the tip of the iceberg of this particular class. We're going to be covering, as I say, a wide number of topics to really help explain how to get the right exposure. And so these are the 12 sections in this class that we're going to be going through. I'm going to give you a little preview later on here in this introductory part of the class. But this is something that I think is going to be very helpful to all levels of photographers. So whether you're new or somewhat seasoned or professional, there's going to be things in here that I trust you are going to learn and you are going to be able to put into practice and make better photos with. Now, along with this class, which is going to be fairly lengthy and fairly in-depth, as I say, is also the notes that come with the class. And so these are some of the highlight graphics from the class, additional information. This is something uh, you can print out if you want. It's kind of long. Um, it takes up a lot of pages here, but it's got uh, information that you can view as a PDF on your computer or on your mobile device, so you can take with you, have with you very easily. As I say, there's going to be a lot of graphics that we have from the class in here. As you can tell, I'm kind of into graphics and visuals. So that's in here, as I say, additional information, a um, little bit of text, a little bit of information about how each of these things work. And so that is an important component that comes with the purchase of the class. And also along with that, learning photography involves taking photos. Yes, I realize that. And so we have a learning projects here. And so there's a number of places throughout this class that I feel you would really stand to educate a lot uh, if you went out and actually practice certain particular things. And so in here are step-by-step -step guides and places for you to keep your notes as to how you set your camera up and make these various settings and create different types of photographs using different techniques. And so this is a step-by-step -step guide to show you how to go out and do it yourself. And so combined with the class notes and the class, we've got a very full class covered for you. So let's go ahead and get started with the introduction. Now, this first section is a bit of a primer on the rest of the class. We're going to be covering a few topics. They're not always beginner topics, but they are important to, I think, all photographers who are trying to really nail down their exposure. After I go through these, I'm going to do a quick preview of what the remainder of the class looks like. All right, let's talk about the basics of light. This is what photography is. It is writing with light. So light is usually coming from the sun or some other light source, and it hits something that you want to photograph, your subject. And 
what you really want to know is how much light is reaching that particular subject. Now, if you could do this, which you can with an incident light meter, you have one of these little handy devices, well, you can just take that right up to your subject, press the magic button on there, and it will tell you what shutter speed, aperture, and ISO to shoot at, and boom, you don't need this class. Well, not quite that easy, but it at least would give you a proper exposure for that subject. And these things are great devices, and we're going to talk about them a little bit later in this class uh, when we talk about some of the tools and other things that you can use with lighting. Now, the problem is, is that most people are using cameras that have a reflected light meter in the camera itself, and it measures the light that is reaching the camera coming from the subject, which is coming from the original source. And so now this is a bit of a problem because we have the original light source, that's step one, and then step two is your subject, which can vary in brightness, and then it gets to your camera finally here. Let's take a look at how this works on your camera. So with a mirrorless camera, light comes in to the image sensor and the image sensor has a lot of pixels to read information and can do an amazingly good job at giving you a good exposure reading of that particular scene. Now with kind of the previous generation of cameras, the digital SLR, light would come in and it would hit that first primary mirror. It would then go through that mirror because it was a partially silvered mirror to a secondary mirror onto a third mirror and then finally onto the light sensor in the camera. Now these were developed over the years and they got more and more sophisticated and they were quite good. They're not as good as the ones in the mirrorless cameras but this has generally been a technology that has uh, reached a bit of a plateau where it's, it's gotten very good and it now needs an educated user to really make the best use of it. So with either type of camera, you are getting a good metering system and this is generally how it works. Now, the thing is, is that this light meter system built into your camera, my camera, everybody's camera, is based on an average of light and dark and everything else, which happens to be around 18% gray. At least that seems to be the uh, group's decision on photography as to what's the average of light and dark. So everything in the camera is averaged out at 18% gray. You used to be able to go into a camera store and buy an 18% gray card, and I think you still can if you want to measure the light bouncing off of that rather than your particular subject. But if you have a subject that's halfway between light and dark and you take a photo of it with the in-camera light meter, you should get a good result. Now, here's where things change. Let's say your subject is really dark. Well, what's going to happen is even though the light source is exactly the same brightness, less light is going to bounce off of that subject and reach your camera. Your camera's meter will see it as very dark and your camera doesn't think anything is dark, so it tries to average this out by giving you recommendations for shutter speeds, apertures, or in other ways to lighten up this subject so that it's average tone. The problem is, is it's going to lighten up this dark subject as well as everything else around it. Now the exact same problem happens in the opposite way with a bright subject. And so in this case, light hits a white subject, white light bounces back to your camera, camera thinks it's very bright, your meter tells your camera to, hey, let's make this darker, let's make this average gray, and it darkens everything down. And so it really depends on the brightness of the light as well as the reflectivity of that particular subject as to how accurate of an exposure you're going to get. So just know that no matter how much money you spend on a camera, these light meters are all calibrated exactly the same for 18% gray, which means they're gonna be right a pretty good percentage of the time, but they're going to be wrong for a notable percentage of the time as well. And so this is where it takes an intelligent user to step in and make some adjustments. And those are the types of things that we're going to get into more details later on in this class. Next concept I want to talk about is exposure value. This is a brightness scale that was designed explicitly for photography and photographers. It measures brightness with a pretty simple scale. Now this started back in about the mid 1950s. Uh, developer wanted to have a simple scale that just measured brightness with a single number. And I like, I like the simplicity of that. And then you could derive shutter speeds, apertures, and ISOs 
from that brightness scale. Now they started the scale at zero, which is a pretty reasonable thing to do. And they says, you know, what's the darkest thing that you could ever imagine taking any photos of? Well, it would be maybe using ISO 100 with a 1.0 lens for one full second. This seemed like a really, really dark environment back then. Uh, side note, times have changed. Uh, but at the time, this seemed like that's the bottom of the scale and that's as low as we need it to go. Zero does not mean no light. It's just pretty dark. How dark would this be? It might be um, maybe a half moon on out at night. Um, and so it's, it's a pretty dark environment, but it's not pitch black. So now as we go up the scale, we go from zero to one, we've moved one full EV up, which is twice the light. Every one of these increments is twice the light. So in this particular case, EV1 is ISO 100 F1.0 with a half second exposure. Allow in half as much light, you then have one step higher on the EV scale. So each step up, doubles the amount of light. So you can see we get a lot more light if we move up just a relatively short margin here. EV6, that is pretty common for an indoor room lighting, a standard room lit normally. Go all the way up to EV12, that's a cloudy day, depending on the cloud level. And then EV15 is a sunny day. Certainly there couldn't be anything brighter than a sunny day, right? Well, actually there are some things where if you are very close to very bright lights, it can get even brighter than that. So there is no real end to this particular scale, but you're not likely to encounter anything much beyond 20, but it is possible to get up there. Going all the way back down to zero, as I mentioned before, ISO 100, 1.0, 1 second. Well, we could put the camera into ISO 1600 now. This wasn't as practical back in the 1950s, and we can bump up the ISO far beyond that now. And so, we actually want that scale to go down a little bit further, which is why some cameras are rated to have EV metering and focusing systems that work into the minus number. Minus doesn't need negative amount of light. It's just a very low level of light, and this is the EV scale. And they might have calibrated it wrong at the very beginning. Uh, in retrospect, I would say it kind of looks like that right now, but this is the scale that we have, and this is the way a lot of devices work. So it's good to have kind of a core understanding of how this works. Now, when you look at a particular photograph, you could, if you had the right material, to go in and you could analyze different areas and you could measure the brightness and you could see where they fall on a particular scale. And this is going to be very helpful because in just a moment, we're going to talk about the range that your camera can handle. Your camera cannot handle EV23 and EV-5 all in the same shot, at least not without some trickery to make that happen. And so think about brightness in the frame. As you look through the viewfinder, what's the brightest element in the frame? What's the darkest element in the frame? How bright is it? How dark is it? What is the range between them? And this is going to help you out by understanding light, because the more you know about light, the better you're going to be able to handle your exposures. Now this exposure value chart, as I mentioned, these single digit numbers actually refer to combinations of shutter speeds, apertures, and ISOs. And guess what? They make a chart just for figuring it all out. Now there's a couple of different types of charts and I want to show you two different styles. This first one, it's got lots of numbers and it's pretty simple to read at first if you can get past all the small numbers. All right, over on the left hand side, you have your EV ratings. Up along the top, you have your aperture ratings. And then in the middle, you have all your different shutter speeds. So let's say it's a sunny day, EV15, and you would like to use F16. Well, you follow those to the middle and you get 125th of a second and boom, that is your exposure. And so pretty simple to use. Now let's say it's still that sunny day, but you want to use a faster shutter speed like 1 4,000th of a second. Well, that's going to put you in need of an F2.8 lens. So if you have a dim room lighting around six and you want to shoot at 1 30th of a second, you're going to need an F 1.4 lens. Now, if you wanted to shoot at F eight in this dimly lit room, you're going to need a one second exposure. So this chart's kind of nice. It's very simple to use, but you do need to reproduce it pretty large to be able to see the actual shutter speeds on there. Another common chart is kind of based in an unusual way. 
we have exposure values starting on the left hand side and then stretching across the top. And so if you have an EV rating of a particular number, you would follow that line down to where there is an intersection where you would have apertures on the right hand side. And as you might guess, shutter speeds down along the bottom. So if we have a sunny day, once again, at EV15, that's going to match up with F16, follow it over, follow it down, 125th of a second. You want a fast shutter speed like a 4,000th of a second? You're going to need a 2.8 lens. The dim lit room with an EV of 6, well, if you want to use a 30th of a second, there's your 1.4. If you want to shoot at F8, follow that over, and that'll be 1.0. So one of the important concepts to understand is one stop of light. And so this is one EV, one exposure value. So you could actually go up or down. Now, the stop of light came from the aperture stop on the lens. A lot of lenses had dials back in the old day and you would move it one stop and then two stops and three stops and you would move back and forth with these stops. And so we referred to moving the aperture as a stop. So if we go from F8, we go up to F11, or we might go down to F5.6. And since that stop just seemed like a very convenient name for a doubling or cutting in half of the light, we just kind of applied it to shutter speeds and we've applied it to ISOs. And so you'll hear that term used. Now, why is one stop important? Well, it's kind of a nice notable increment from one image to the next. If you look at the plus minus zero to the minus one, that's very clearly darker. And if you go to the plus one, well, that's very clearly lighter. And so when you know you want to make not a huge jump, but a very distinct step from one to the other, you'd move your exposure about one stop. Now, a slightly funny story, at least in retrospect, is I got my degree in photography. And while I was in college, in my final year in college, I was working at the city newspaper and I was working with another photographer. He was kind of my mentor and we were working in the studio on something. And he says during one particular point that we should probably just open the lens up a third of a stop. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, just open it up a third of a stop. I said, well, how do you do that? Now, a little backstory is back in those days, I had a camera that had a shutter speed dial on the top that had full increments of shutter speeds. They didn't have any third stops. Um, I put film in of 100, 200, 400. There were no third stops with ISO or film speed. And the aperture I had just had indications for the different apertures. And I hadn't really noticed that you could kind of stop partway through one third, half, two thirds in between these. And that's the third of a stop is you can adjust things much more easily nowadays, now that everything's digital and we have shutter speed dials and ISO dials that can stop at every third increment. So the third stop is another important step because it's the baby step. If you want something just a smidgen lighter or a smidgen darker, you would adjust it by a third of a stop. Now you can do this with your apertures, your shutter speeds, and in most cases, but not all cases, your ISOs, depends on the camera. Some cameras put in restrictions on where you can do that. Now, this might be called 0 0.3 or 1 over 3. And I know for you mathematical nerds, you're saying those numbers aren't the same. And you're right. 0.3 is not the same as 1 third, but you know what? It's close enough in this particular world. We're just going to let it go. Just let it go. It's a third of a stop. And that's what we're talking about. All right, so that is your exposure value. All right, next up, let's talk about the dynamic range. This is the range of light from the darkest to the brightest pixels that you can record in your camera. The bigger your dynamic range, the more tones and subtle variations of light that you can capture. And this is going to be to your benefit. Now, we could kind of break lighting situations into two broad categories. First up is high dynamic range. These are photos and images and scenes that have really bright pixels as well as really dark pixels. And one of the things I want to show you is on this particular image, which is a particularly contrasty image here, is that this image 
has a lot of darks, as we can see on this histogram, and a lot of lights. And we're going to go more into the histograms later on in this class. There's a whole section on it, but I know a lot of you have kind of seen this. But it shows you the range of brightness from dark on the left to bright on the right. Now, if we take this original raw shot, as in the camera, and we go into post-production, and we're going to be talking about post-production in this class, and you were to say, well, the contrast range of this image is too much. I would like to reduce and decrease this contrast. It generally doesn't look very good when you do that. In fact, it looks horrible. And so this is not something that we can do in post-production very easily is by decreasing this contrast. However, let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum, which is going to be low dynamic range images. Images that when you look at them on the histogram, they're all kind of bunched up in the middle. All the tones are kind of similar. Take this picture of the sand dunes. If you'll notice the histogram, most of the information is contained in about half the width of this particular histogram. So this is a relatively low dynamic range shot. If we take this and we increase the contrast, well, it does add a little bit of spice and a little bit more interest to this image. It gives it a little bit more pop if you will, because it has a little bit more contrast in there. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture both the brightest and the darkest pixels in any particular image. And by having a wide dynamic range on our camera, we're going to be able to capture all of that and work with it in post-production. So one criteria to look at in a camera, it's not one that a lot of people look at, is what's the dynamic range? How many tones can it capture in that camera? Now, there are places that you can go on the internet that will test all the cameras out and tell you how good they do. So, as of the latest checking, the best cameras out there can record almost 15 stops of range. Now, one of these cameras is almost five years old now. And so, these can be older cameras, but the fact of the matter is, is a lot of the new popular cameras have an extremely good dynamic range. It's very subtle. Anything over 12 EV is considered very good when it comes to dynamic range. So you can look up your camera, see how good it is. There was kind of a, a period of time in camera development where this was a little bit more of a disparity between one manufacturer and the next. And some led, some were following, but mo for the most part, most companies have gotten really good in this regard. So it's not a major concern anymore, in my opinion. Another very important baseline thing to understand about cameras these days is how they shoot photos and how they store them. The two predominant systems are RAW and JPEG. RAW is the original information that came from the sensor without any or at least minimal manipulation. And this is the original data that you get to go back to to work with when you're developing and optimizing and printing your images. And then there's the JPEG, which is the very convenient processed, compressed file, which is very simple and easy to use for daily life. Let's talk about the JPEG at first. So this starts with the sensor. We've got original data off of here. And it does go through some processing. And there's a whole bunch of different things that are going on. The color space is being set. The white balance is being set. Contrast, how much contrast should be in the image. This can be changed between portraits and landscapes because they have a little different look to them. And so all sorts of little things that are going on to make your image look good. There is often a size option where you can choose large, medium, or small, depending on your file size needs. And then it goes through compression. And this is where it looks at data, like maybe a blue sky with shovel shades of blue. And it might compress it down to a fewer number. Or if you're compressing a lot, it can really crush it down to a smaller number so that your file size is smaller in size. Now, if you do this too much, you're going to get this artifacting and compression and these banding lines. And this is something that you may see only if you are saving JPEGs over and over again. But this is what's happening kind of on a very detailed level with the JPEG image. And this is a problem why serious photographers don't like shooting with JPEG for many or all of their work is that the information is being lost almost as fast as you can capture it. You're not capturing and keeping all the important data. Now, having said that, I will quickly jump in and say, I shoot JPEG. Not all the time, but, you know, from time to time. Certain things, uh, small file sizes, simple work uh, problems are fine with me because I've got the exposure dialed in. 
and I know exactly what I'm doing with it and it has limited use case and I'll shoot JPEGs all day long for particular events. It's just I don't use it all the time and not on certain types of things. Let's talk about the RAW now, the original information that comes off the sensor. Well, it's about as original as you can get. Uh, there are size options sometimes with cameras. They'll have a, a large RAW or a small RAW. Not too common, but it does happen. Bit depth. Now this one's kind of interesting because there is different styles of bit depth that can be contained depending on what you have. And so we're going to talk more about this in a moment. It does need to go through a RAW converter so that it can actually make a file out of it. And so that's just part of the process. Uh, there is white balance applied, but it is removable and completely adjustable later on. So it's not really anything you need to worry about. And then you end up with a raw file. Now a raw file to a non-photographer is a bit of a problem because you need special programs to read these raw files. They don't work in every program that JPEG does. And so the camera manufacturer supplies you with free software in most all cases on how to read and work with your files. Uh, but there are other manufacturers like Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop, which update it as soon as new cameras are introduced so that you can use their files in their software. And most good software companies will update pretty quickly when new cameras come out onto the market. So you do need to be invested in the right type of software. It's available for free, uh, but it's just part of the small price to pay to take advantage of this original negative, if you will, from the camera. So let's look at this in a different way, comparing RAW and JPEG. And we're going to have higher quality on the left and lower quality on the right as we go through the options. Both might have different resolutions that are available. You might be able to choose large, medium, or small. It really depends on the camera. And so if you do know what you want, you can set that in there. Processing, minimal to none with RAW and with JPEG, it handles processing and the look of several different aspects to your photograph. The bit depth can be either 12 to 14 bit, depending on how your camera shoots RAWs. And with JPEGs, it's only eight bit depths. And this is where I wanna take a little closer look at what this bit depth is. So this is the depth of the color that you are recording. With JPEGs, you're getting eight bit, which means you get 250 shades of red, blue, and green for a total of 16 million colors. And that sounds like it's pretty good. And you know what? For most things, especially things viewed on a screen, yeah, it's probably pretty good and probably enough for most people under most uses. Now, I want to introduce you to something new here. There is a new file format that is kind of gaining momentum, you might say. It's called a HIFE, and it's 10-bit. And like a JPEG, it's compressed, it's fairly small. In fact, it's about the same size as the JPEG because they have very smart, more advanced compression algorithms because HIFE is about, I don't know, two decades newer technology than the way JPEGs are created in the, in, the, in the way that it does it. And so you're able to get 134 million colors with HIFE. Now, as I say, this is growing in popularity. I don't know where it's going, if it's going to disappear in a few years or if it's going to replace JPEGs completely in the world. But I just wanted to let you know a little bit more about it here because you want to keep your eye on it. This is, a, this is an up and comer, you might say. All right, now getting more into the RAWs. Uh, some cameras have 12-bit RAWs. Sometimes it's an option you can choose in your camera. Sometimes cameras will automatically switch between 12 and 14-bit, depending on how fast you're shooting. In order to shoot faster, they might drop it down to 12-bit. How would you know about this? Well, you can check in with, uh, with those people who like to test the cameras and review them and analyze them in that type of way. And so it really depends on the camera. So now we're up to 68 billion colors. And now we're talking about some serious data. And this is going to be really good for anyone who wants to edit their images, which means do a little bit of manipulation, adjusting the highlights and the shadows. And this is going to be important in this class for anybody who's interested in getting the right exposure. Now, most cameras these days are shooting 14-bit RAWs. And so it's a very good quality RAW. We're up to 4.4 trillion, that's right, trillion colors. And so we have a lot of data to work with. If you want to edit your images, if you want to print them, this is great information to have because you can really make a lot of fine tune adjustments and it's going to come out looking very, very clean on your final image. All right, next up is the compression. 
Now, we know that JPEG can be compressed. There's low, medium, and high options. Sometimes more, they might have different names depending on the companies uh, that you are working with. Now, the raw images, there is a, uh, a couple of different options here. One is uncompressed. That sounds really good, but it does end up being a very, very large file size. Then there is lossless compressed, which means that they're going to compress it, but they're going to do so in a way where you don't lose quality. And I know this seems like magic, but there's some really smart mathematicians who know what they're doing, and most people are perfectly fine shooting lossless compressed. Now, there is also a compressed option, and this is a uh, typically a very light level of compression when it comes to raw. And so I tend not to use it, but it's not that bad of a, of a thing. A compressed raw is much better than any JPEG, in my opinion. Now, file sizes, well, that's going to depend on the camera you have. Uh, 24 megapixel, you'll see that the file sizes are quite a bit larger with RAW than they are with JPEG. Whether you have a 50 megapixel camera, well, you can see that those file sizes are going to be vastly different between RAW and JPEG. And this is where some newcomers to photography might get misled and thinking, well, JPEG's better because I get more images on a memory card. And more is not really a problem and not really what's most important here. It's quality, and this is where you're going to get that with the RAW. And then when it's all said and done, what type of file type you end up with. JPEG is this one common uniform JPG uh, that's going to work in virtually every imaging visual program out there. Whereas with RAW, you're going to need to use special software in order to read the proprietary RAW that comes from your camera's manufacturer. Now, as I say, they all supply you with free software on how to read it, but there's a lot of other great software, some of it is free, that you can use to read these other file types. Let's take a look at an example of the difference between JPEG and RAW and where it's going to really help you in exposure. So in this particular image, shot it in the studio and I wanted to underexpose a portion of this image. Now I shot it with JPEG and I shot it with RAW and I wanted to simulate what happens if I take it into post-production and try to brighten it up by five stops. Well, as you can see on screen, there's a lot more information in that RAW than there is in the JPEG. What if we were to reverse it around and overexpose a section of the image and then try to take that and resurrect it by bringing the, dark, bringing the darkness down, you might say, and darkening it up to see how much information is still left. And you can see there is a tremendous more information in the RAW image. If we look at the histograms and we compare them, one of the things we'll notice that is in the JPEG image, there are huge data gaps where the JPEG algorithm has just thrown out information that in this particular case we needed later on. Now with the overexposed image, well, the JPEG just threw out a whole bunch of information and it was lost never to be gotten back again. And so when you want to be able to make those adjustments in post-production, this is where the raw image is really going to help you. Now in your camera, every camera menu is a little bit different, but there's going to be somewhere in the file system, in the menu system, where you can change between RAW and JPEG. You can choose between small, medium, and large JPEGs in most all cases, and in some cases with RAWs, you'll have different versions. You'll have a just a, a straight RAW, sometimes you might have large or small, or you might have a compressed option, and this is where you're going to get that proprietary file from your manufacturer, depending on whose camera you have. Now, every system is going to look a little bit different. I got a Canon and Nikon on here just to show you two different ways. And yes, you can shoot JPEG and RAW at the same time, kind of a separate issue, but you can do that in virtually all cameras. And so hopefully you can see here that RAW images just give you a lot more information. And if you really want to take advantage of being able to push your images as far as they can go, then RAW is the way to go. If you can really dial in your exposures, you can shoot JPEG in many cases, so long as you get that dialed in. If you have an image that is kind of off and it's a little too bright, a little too dark, a raw image is going to really, really help you out because it gives you a lot more latitude in both those areas, especially though in the shadow areas. Now I do want to talk about something that I don't like to talk about, which is the exposure triangle. This is uh, a common learning tool that a lot of photographers talk about when they're teaching photography. It's not something that I traditionally use in my classes because, 
Well, it's got some problems, but let's just talk about what it is. The exposure triangle, in my mind, is a three-sided slide rule. I never actually used a slide rule, but I know what they do. You slide one lever up and down, and you can kind of figure where two things meet or where they match up or a combination of how they work together. But in photography, we have three main components. And if you can imagine a three-sided slide rule, I think that's what the exposure triangle is. Now, the idea is that on each one of these sides of the triangle, you control one aspect of photography, and by moving in one direction, you're going to make your image lighter, and if you move in the other direction, you're going to make it darker. So let's say you want a faster shutter speed. Okay, well, you set that up. That's going to make your image darker. So what you're going to do is you're going to have to lighten it up with one of the other two options. Let's say you want to use the aperture to go up to f2. Well, that would solve the problem, but what if you don't have an f2? Your lens is an f5.6. Well, then you're going to have to do it with the ISO. So it just shows you when you change one thing, you're going to have to change something else, or you're going to have to do a combination of the other two things. And so there's a lot of problems when it comes to this exposure triangle, and so don't let it bother you too much. Um, first off, there's no standard to the exposure triangle. Just look it up right now. Look up exposure triangle, and they're going to look different than mine. Some people put shutter speed on one side or the bottom or the other side. Uh, they have the numbers running in the other direction. There is no convention to this at all, okay? This does not really indicate correct exposure in any way. And for certain people, you know, the ISO doesn't affect the incoming light to the camera, so that shouldn't even be part of the equation at all. And this doesn't factor in how much light is coming into the camera. And so there's a lot of issues that are going on with this. It's really not very good for, an, for a serious photographer at all because this is not a photography tool. It's just a simple concept to let beginners know there's three important things. All right, and there's actually more than three, but there's three critical changes that you can make on the camera to adjust the amount of light. And I think that's fine for letting people know that. We're gonna be talking about shutter speeds, apertures, and ISOs, and the exposure triangle gets that message across, and that is nearly the last time you'll ever hear about it in this class. Exposure preview. Okay, so this is a little detail on how modern cameras work, something you wanna be aware of. With the DSLR, kind of the mainstay of cameras for a long period of time, light hit a mirror, went up through a prism system, and you looked at it with your own eyes. And so you got to see a, a version of the real world, if you will. You were viewing life through the prism and mirrors. Now with a mirrorless camera, light comes into the sensor, and then it shows you an electronic version. It shows you a digital version of what your camera is looking at. And that little TV screen that you're looking at, that little tiny monitor, well, that can be adjusted in a lot of different ways, and it could fool you or not, or it could help you, depending on how the camera is set up. And this is something that is generally called exposure preview. So, for instance, if you have exposure preview turned on, and you start adjusting your shutter speeds to let in less light, you're going to have your screen go darker. And so your screen mimics your exposure indicator. If it's lighter than normal, it's going to show you that it's lighter than normal. And this is fantastic for a lot of different types of photographers, anywhere from beginner to professional, to really be a fail-safe on whether you are setting your camera up properly to get a proper exposure. But it's a problem at other times. And sometimes you want a clear screen and image to focus on and compose with, no matter where your shutter speed or aperture may be. And so you can turn this off in all cameras that are mirrorless. And this is really important because you want to turn this off when you're working in the studio and many times, not all times, but many, maybe most times, when you are using flash photography. And this is something that we'll be talking about much more later on in the class. And so here are some common names that you'll find from some of the common manufacturers. You're going to have to dig through the menus to actually find where this is, but this is something that's very important in the setup of your camera is to do you want your camera to mimic the exact exposure, which I think is great most of the time, but where do you turn it off when you're starting to use flash photography? So those are some of the most important primer elements to this class. Next up, I just want to give you a quick preview of what's in the remainder of this class. Section two, we're going to dive into shutter speeds. We're going to talk about 
the types of shutters, mechanical versus electronic, the effects, really nitpicky things to look for with different shutter speeds, how to get them set up, uh, what recommendations there are for different types of action, and then there's gonna be a shutter speed quiz. And in fact, I'm gonna give you a preview of the quiz right now just so that you can get a taste for what we're gonna be talking about. So here's a question. For what type of subject does shutter speed not matter? Mm-hmm, okay. That answer will be revealed in section two. Next up in section three, it's all about the aperture. We're gonna be talking about the different settings, the maximum aperture, depth of field, equivalent aperture for different size sensors, special effects from them, and the starburst effect. And so in this section, we are also gonna have a quiz. Would you like a tester's knowledge of aperture here? All right, here's your quiz. Name two types of subjects for which the amount of depth of field is not critical. Not critical. Now, I'm not saying that the aperture is not important, but I'm saying that the depth of field, it's not critical. And this is gonna be really hard. I, I think there's gonna be very few people who get both of these questions answered correctly. And it's something I'll let you know more about in section three. Section four on ISO, we're gonna be looking at sensors a little bit and how good they are at resolving at different ISO levels. We'll be talking about noise, of course. And I'm gonna be talking a lot more about auto ISO how it's set, where you wanna use it, and a lot more details about that. Section five is all on metering. There's a lot of different tools that we have at our disposal for making sure that we get the best exposure. Now, I know I said earlier that raw images are pretty pliable, that they can be brightened and darkened with quite a bit of ease, but that shouldn't stop you from really trying to get the right exposure. Following that best practice is going to give you the most versatility down the road, so you want to try to nail it right in camera. The RAW is a nice backup in case you do need to push things a little bit further. Next up is exposure modes in section six. We're going to be talking about all the different modes that you might have on a mode dial. Not all cameras have that. Some cameras just have a mode button. Don't worry, we'll talk about everything in there. And sometimes cameras just have a bunch of dials, and that's great too, but they all kind of work the same way. So we're going to go through the different programs, shutter priority, aperture priority, manual, the new flexible priority, which is starting to become more popular. And we'll really talk about the intricacies of how these work. Next up in section seven is exposure adjustment. As I talked about at the beginning of this section, the light meter in the camera wants to give you an average exposure. And there's a lot of reasons why you're gonna to want to not follow the guideline of your camera's meter. And this section is gonna explain many different ways on how to do it and where you might wanna do it. All right, this is gonna probably be one of your favorite sections, I hope so. Uh, the exposure settings. This is where I break down five common techniques that pretty much everything in photography can fall into these five categories and how you go about setting up shutter speeds, apertures, ISOs, and dealing with some difficult light in these situations. And, what things do you compromise? What do you stick your guns to on how you make your settings? And if it's not enough, well, let's just actually do portraits, actions, and landscape in here as well. And we're gonna be showing you exactly where you would set your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture, working with the light meter and making those adjustments so that you can end up with the best possible exposure possible in here. We'll also be talking about high and low key images. We'll be talking about the Sunny 16 rule, the exposing to the right, HDR stuff, and we've got a long quiz in here that's really gonna test your knowledge. This is a, a fun section, I think. This is tricky exposures. I've highlighted five different tricky situations which require vastly different techniques on how you solve the problem of getting a good exposure under these very tricky situations. And so there's a lot of good advice in this section. Tools and techniques, well, there's a lot of things that you can do in order to help you out when you wanna get the right exposure, whether they be tools or techniques or other technology that's going on, there's a variety of things in here that it will become very helpful to any photographer. All right, a very new section for me on artificial light. We'll be talking about continuous speed lights and strobes. You see, when you talk about ambient exposure, we have our three hallmarks, but with flash, it's a little bit different. And there's some interesting overlap of these two different worlds and how you control your ambient exposure versus your flash exposure. So I'm gonna go through some detailed explanation 
as to how these devices work and how to get good exposures with them. And our final section is on post-production. We're gonna be talking about the adjustments of how you take that best image that you could capture and make it the best possible image that you can. And so there's a lot of tweaks and adjustment in here. We're gonna be software agnostic here, so we're not gonna be going in about one particular brand of software. This is kind of generally how all software works, so you can work with whatever it is that you happen to have. All right, folks, there you go. That is your introduction to the class. It is just the beginning of a very long and very in-depth class on the most important part about photography is getting that exposure correct. So stick with me for the rest of this because there is a lot of stuff to go through.